It's Friday the 10th of April and this is Yes Sporto News. Hello and welcome to our weekly news roundup. I'm Cam Tate and I've been scouring the web over the past seven days looking for all the weird and wonderful news stories from the motoring world. I'm also going to sprinkle in some of my own opinion because some of the stories that we feature on here are pretty damn ridiculous. Last week, for instance, we covered Dr. Helmut Marko's coronavirus camp for Formula One drivers. You can watch that by clicking on the link in the top right hand corner. Right, on to our first story of the week and we're going to talk about the McLaren Elva. It's the limited edition speedster model that's inspired by the McLaren M1A racing car from the 1960s and costs £1.4 million. Now, before you think I've gone mad, I do understand that the McLaren Elva was announced about six months ago and that McLaren probably told its more affluent customers about the car far earlier than that. However, what's changed this week is the number of examples that they'll be making. See, McLaren originally planned to produce 399 examples of the Elva to ensure exclusivity, but this week they lowered that number to 249 examples to ensure even more exclusivity. McLaren said that its customers thought the 399 figure was simply too high and would make the Elva a commoner in the eyes of the collector. Read between the lines though and there's a slightly different story to unpick. McLaren has been on a product offensive ever since launching the MP412C back in 2011 and now there are countless models spread across its sports, super, hyper and GT series product lines. There's a lot of component sharing between them as well. Many of them use the underpinnings and engine as the McLaren 720S. So you would be a little bit annoyed if you spent a million pounds on a car that mechanically wasn't all that different to one that costs a fifth of that. We don't know how many pre-orders McLaren has taken for the Elva, but I highly doubt the company would turn down 150 customer deposits in the name of exclusivity. And with the multi-million pound speed tail on the horizon, which by the way, uses the 4 liter V8 from the 720S, I wouldn't be surprised if McLaren's ultra-rich customers are starting to feel hypercar fatigue. But what do you think? Is McLaren releasing too many cars at once? Or is it a sign that they're actually taking the fight to their main rival, Ferrari? Either way, let me know what you think by leaving me a comment down below. Like an episode of The One Show, I'm gonna jump from hypercars to crossovers with silly names, and specifically the new Citroen C4 Cactus, which has just been spike testing in the wild. Now there's a reason why the new Cactus has grabbed our attention. You see, the crossover market is full, absolutely crammed full of cars that do an excellent job of being practical family runabouts, but they're all about as interesting as staring blankly into space waiting for this damn isolation period to be over. And that's where the Citroen C4 Cactus comes in. It was the only interesting car in its segment of the market. And that's mainly because it was surrounded by these airbags that were designed to protect the bodywork, but also any pedestrians that wander out in front of you and see this massive bouncy castle hurtling towards them. While the spy shots don't reveal whether the funky gray crash pads will return on the Citroen C4 Cactus, we do know that it'll have a sporty roof line that looks a little bit like a Mercedes GLC Coupe and have a little spoiler integrated into the boot lid. Don't think Citroen's gone all sporty on us though. The new C4 Cactus will likely share its underpinnings with the Peugeot 2008 and will therefore probably carry over the Pug's 1.2 litre three cylinder petrol engine and the 1.5 litre four pot diesel motor. However, shots of the crossover taken earlier this year suggest the car will also get an electric option as the development mule had some high voltage warning stickers stuck on the side of it. We've also heard that the Cactus name will be dropped and the car will simply be called the Citroen C4, which is a bit of a shame because the Cactus name kind of reflected the car's interesting personality. But at least it'll still stand out amongst its rivals thanks to that coupe-like roofline. Okay, on to the aftermarket world an area that's full of tasteless exhaust systems and gaudy body kits. But for every Mansory or Liberty Walk, there is a Roof or an Alpina. Audi specialists apt, a German tuning arm that thinks that RS models are too boring, falls in the latter category. The reason I'm bringing them up is because they've just turned their attention to the new RS6. The results are pretty interesting. Called the RS6R, the new super estate, or are we in hyper estate territory here? Anyway, 
The estate's 4-litre twin-turbo V8 engine has been bumped up from a measly 592 brake horsepower and 800 newton meters of torque to a crazy 730 brake horsepower and 920 newton meters of torque. That's an insane amount of power. In fact, it's almost 100 brake horsepower more than Audi's V10 engined R8. Apt hasn't announced a revised 0 to 62 time just yet, but there's no doubt it'll eclipse the standard car's time of 3.6 seconds, and it could very well rival the R8's 0 to 62 dash of 2.9 seconds. That's hypercar levels of performance in a car so big you could probably live in it. While it's as big as a house, and about as heavy as one too, the RS6R received some visual tweaks to give it a racier look over the standard model. For example, the semi-dinner plate wheels look a bit like those from Audi's Formula E machine, and there are several carbon fibre canards dotted around the car for some DTM appeal. I'll admit I'm not usually a fan of aftermarket companies making sports cars look more aggressive. You could say I'm more Alpina than AC Schnitzer. But I'm going to make an exception with the RS6R. I mean, what's not to love about a 730 brake horsepower family wagon? But I want to know what you think. Which would you have? The standard RS6 or would you pay a little bit more and get the RS6R? Let us know what you think and what others had to say by entering the Yes Auto poll in the top right hand corner. Right, I've got a question for you. What do you think the future of racing will look like? Because if you think about it, racing cars haven't evolved all that much in the past 100 years. They still have four wheels, they're connected to the tarmac using tyres, and fundamentally, they can't fly. But a change is on the horizon because an Australian company called Airspeeder is launching a new championship that promises to be the Formula One of flying cars. Now granted, the company did announce its plans last year, but this week they secured extra funds to help their radical idea become a reality. The cars, or octocopters as they're officially called, are essentially single-seater racing machines, albeit with eight propellers instead of four wheels. The octocopters are equipped with the 500 kilowatt hour battery pack that powers four 32 brake horsepower electric motors for a combined output of 124 brake horsepower. That's not a lot, really. But the flying car only weighs 250 kilograms, so you'd better not eat a massive pie before entering a race. And yes, these will be driven by real people sat in the cockpit, not a team of drone enthusiasts all fighting over a controller back on terra firma. That's pretty impressive, especially as there isn't really anything like this around at the moment. I mean, how many octocopter pilots do you know? It also sounds extremely dangerous. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand that racing is dangerous because if you trip over one of your competitors at 200 miles an hour, you're gonna hurt yourself. But that amplifies by a factor of, I don't know, a million when you're in the skies because if something goes wrong, the only way you're going is down and you'll be going down at a vast rate of knots. Again, let me know what you think about this. Are we really heading towards a real world F-Zero? Personally, I quite like the idea of it because it sounds far more interesting than Formula E. But is this something you could see yourself watching on a Sunday afternoon? Let me know in the comments down below. That just about wraps up this week's episode of Yes Auto News. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be back again next week, but in the meantime, you can check out all the latest car news and reviews at yesauto.com, or you can check us out on social media. Just type in Yes Auto UK on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Cam Tate. Thank you so much for liking this video and subscribing to the channel. I'll see you again next week.